And I hope you all had at least a slice of pizza, if not two. They have a whole table back there full of all candy and goodies. So please feel free to continue to have lunch as I speak. And I've already eaten, so I'm not going to be all like, <gasps> over your food. So you're totally safe. But thank you so much again for inviting me to come and share my story. And as she said, I've been speaking as a mental health advocate for a number of years and my story has become my job and it, and it has become this new adventure that I've been on. Not only am I a survivor of suicide, I have a, the eating disorder journey story, I have the bipolar 2 journey story, um, but I also just have this new uh, perspective on the purpose of why all this happened. When I first started sharing my story, it was about me a lot of times. I first started with, I, I want to share this because I want to I help people, but I also want to feel motivated to move forward. And any time I shared my story, I would move, feel more motivated, I would feel more empowered, and I would learn something new about myself each time. But now my goal has changed a little bit. Actually, a lot. Today, when you leave here, I want you to know more about your journey than about mine. I want to be a mirror and for you to see inside your own experiences. And take that with you wherever you are on your journey of wellness. Because I think stories hold the power to change lives if we allow them to. My story has completely changed my life. All the bad parts and the good parts. And I want to bring a certain piece of the story to you today because we were focusing on mental wellness on campus. And having that conversation of mental health, maybe how to talk about mental health, what it is like to have a mental health condition, maybe throw in some uh, how can we decrease the stigma. So those were the types of things that I want to share with you today through using my story as an illustration. When I was in high school, it was like the mid to late 90s, all right? So that, of course, that was like forever ago. And when I was in high school, this was not a conversation. This was not something that we talked about. I had already experienced extreme circumstances in my family and in my personal life. Some traumatic stuff that, that really changed my, the inside of my brain chemistry to the point where I had started developing a mental health condition that no one knew was there. But in my environment, there was no ever any conversations about anxiety. I don't think I ever even heard the word, honestly. Or depression. Or eating disorder, for that matter. It was just, it wasn't a conversation that was being had. So when I was going through my high school and my college years, there were no words, or I hadn't learned them yet, to express what in the hell was going on inside my brain. My mother always told me that I was different. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> and I was so emotional as a child. Has anything changed? <laughs> but I was also very sensitive. <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> it's like, girl in the front. <laughs> sensitive. Um, any sort of intense in emotion would take me on a huge roller coaster ride. For example, I'm 17 years old, my first boyfriend breaks up with me, my friends would just go out and get a new boyfriend, I wanted to grab a bottle of pills and kill myself. Suicide was the solution every time to my emotional pain because I had no idea that I was living with an undiagnosed bipolar 2 disorder. So I was just different. And I internalized that difference. And it wasn't different in a good way. It was different in a what's wrong with you 
way. Why was I unable to keep up with my friends? Why was I unable to find peace in my life? Why was I unable to feel joy for more than a day before the darkness would close in around me again? By my early 20s and my college years, I had already started this, this dialogue internally, it's deep-rooted conversation with something that I knew nothing about, but I knew that it had this plan for me that it could save me if I just did what it said. Do you know illnesses can talk? I didn't know that this voice did not have my best interest in mind. It said, you know, Amy, if you could just stay thin, then you could stay happy. If you could just stay thin and control your weight, then you can control if your dad is going to reject you or not, or if your peers are going to look at you as you're different, or they're going to accept you for who you are, Amy. You could be something if you could just stay thin. And when you take a little girl, in a teenage body with no self-esteem and no self-image and no identity whatsoever, that is a blank slate for anything to write on. And that eating disorder said, I have a solution to this problem. I think I can create a dialogue inside your head, Amy, that you are no longer able to feel anything other than fat. I have a solution for you, Amy. I know I can take care of you. You don't have to feel the pain anymore. Actually, Ed, promise me, Amy, you'll never feel that kind of pain again. And it was right. I felt a different kind. By the age of 24 years old, still neither eating disorder or bipolar were diagnosed. So what was my brain? It's a ping pong ball. Bipolar moods, bulimia, bipolar moods, just terribly, you know, so I'm extremely unstable. Don't go back and read the journals. You're not allowed in there. Don't go in there. I thought, part of me thought that I still could keep going. I still got this. I got this in control. I'm in control. I'm totally in control of this chaos. But my body had another idea in mind, it said, I can't do this anymore. And the only way to get my attention was to stop working because I wasn't listening to its cues. I wasn't picking up on it. It wasn't saying, I'm starving to death. Feed me. I'm tired. Go to sleep. I ignored my body, and I did everything I could to punish it. Because if my body can stay the enemy, then I don't have to fight the person who hurt me. I was trying to be normal. Did you ever do that? <laughs> kind of. It's hard. I was trying to hold down a job as a secretary, and, and I was only drinking coffee and taking all of these diet pills. And I was trying to starve my hunger and to numb my pain. And I wrote in my journal, there's a monster inside me, and it's going to kill me. And I am so afraid. But I don't know what to do. And if it wasn't the eating disorder tearing me apart, it was the bipolar disorder telling me that I was worth literally nothing. <clears throat> nothing. So it's like I had two abusive relationships going on at the same time, but they were all stuck inside my body. Do you see how destructive that can be? When someone's dealing with an eating disorder and a mental illness, they're literally Parts of themselves are dying in the inside. And the only way to get in there is to get in there any way you can. So one afternoon, I was feeling weak. 
<clears throat> my hands were a little numb. I remember going to the bathroom and grabbing a hold of the counter. Caroline, can you check the camera? I was grabbing a hold of the counter and I remember feeling black coming at me and then nothing until I popped my head back up and I was in a hospital bed in the emergency room and I'm laying there and they have all these sticky patches on me and these tubes and there's like the beep beeps and the, the machines and they got this curtain and these people are, they're squeaky shoes, you know, in the hospital I hear a squeaky tennis shoes. So it's like squeaky tennis shoes and I got like doo -doo 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 beeps and stuff and I look over and I'm like, what the hell? And my best friend's at my side. My mom comes bursting into the hospital room, throws back the curtains and says, how dare you take those pills? I warned you not to. And her anger just spewed across the room because she was terrified because the phone call that she got was Amy almost had a heart attack. You need to get here right now. The doctor walks in with the most excellent bedside manner. This clipboard walks into the room and he gives me the, you have two choices. You can keep going like you're going and you can die or you could get help and you can live. The first thought of was, those are my two choices. Why can't I just live half alive? Why can't I be half in and half out like I have my entire life? How, why can't I just continue to live dead on the outside with a heartbeat? keeps the score. It will come to the point where it says, I'm done. And my body was like, hello. I had enough hope buried deep down inside me. I also am an extremely stubborn person. Okay, don't get in my way. And when I decide that I'm going to do something, watch out. Okay. There was this stubborn woman inside there. You know what she was saying? I'm getting out. And she did. I got on a plane and I flew to Arizona from Delaware. So, okay, so here it is December in Arizona, I mean in, in Delaware, December, it's 35 degrees. I get on a plane, I fly across the country and I land and it's 85 degrees and there's no green. <laughs> and I was like, did we miss Arizona? Is this the Middle East? I had never in my life seen that many shades of brown, ever, <laughs> ever. And I just, I trusted. I said, you know, this is it, this is it. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna put myself all the way in. And I finally got diagnosed, finally. For me, a mental health diagnosis, oh, the right one was, oh my God, it was such a relief. Thank you, Jesus. This is an illness, this isn't me. That little girl that always thought she was different, she wasn't good enough, she was different. She wasn't good enough, she had a devil's disease that she was doing the best she could with at the time. And the bulimia, well that was no little surprise. No surprise there that I was battling with that eating disorder. But it took me 10 years of relapsing because I wasn't finished with my battle with my self-loathing. I wasn't done punishing myself and I wouldn't release myself from the prison until I was done punishing myself emotionally for something that wasn't my fault. And about 10 years after Bermuda, I was about 33 years old. I have a family. I have a, a daughter. She was three years old at the time. She's the cutest, like, carrot red hair. Curly. People would stop on the street like, oh my gosh, your daughter's so pretty. And I'm like, hell no. 
heart. <laughs> You know, and, and the green eyes, and my husband, who knew about my illnesses before he married me, who always wanted me to finally love myself enough. Wait, he loved me, but he couldn't do that for me. He was waiting for me. But my illness, my bipolar disorder, we couldn't find the right medication since giving birth. Every, my chemistry changed. Everything was out of control. Medication after medication after antipsychotic medication. I, I lost my memory. My eyes were rolling up in the back of my head. I couldn't leave my house. I lived in a robe. I never bathed. We had no money because I couldn't work, so I stood in the food bank land in the middle of the summer in Arizona thinking, why the hell is this happening to me? And why can't I fix it? With me. Came to a head. I was standing in my condo and I had saved all the pills that never worked. I had stockpiled. I had pawned off my jewelry. My journal was telling me through my writing that my, my husband was going to be better off with another wife and my daughter would be better off with another mother. I was relieving them of their burden. Suicide's not selfish. And I kept pacing back and forth because I didn't want to die. You guys, people who are suicidal don't want to die. They want their pain to stop. I wanted out. And my mind kept creating that this is your solution. Trust me, this is your solution. And I'm like, I don't know if it is or it isn't. And I walk over to my refrigerator, and there is a hotline magnet just sticking right there on the fridge. I did not put that there. I have no idea how it got there. But it was there. And something inside me said, call. And something inside me responded, and I picked up the phone, and I called, and this guy answers the phone, and he's like, you know, hi, um, what's going on? Tell me where you are. And I remember I was so disconnected from the real world in that moment that his voice was the only thing really connecting me to reality. And I did every single thing he told me to do. He said, promise me you're not going to do anything to hurt yourself. I promised him I wasn't going to do anything to hurt myself. We talked through things. He asked me what I was doing, where I was, what was I holding at the time. And we got very specific about those things. He somehow persuaded me to reach out to someone close and go there for help, to seek safety. Now I know that he used QPR on me, question, persuade, refer. And I have now become a QPR trainer so that I can help save other people's lives the way he did for me. Deep in my suicidality, I did connect with the awesome therapist. It was the right time. It was the right person. She was the right person at the right time, and I was ready. People say, well, how do you know when it's supposed to happen? I was like, it's going to happen when it happens, when you're ready to let go, and when you find the person that gives you that space to make it happen. And I found that therapist. I found a psychiatric nurse who understood the balance between my medications, my mood disorder, my bulimia, because I never wanted to take my medicine because I was afraid it was going to make me fat. You know, the co-occurring disorders, the eating disorder that goes along with the anxiety, the eating disorder that goes along with the bipolar, deadly combinations. They finally got me to a space to fight. One night, during that same time, I had just been released from the psychiatric hospital. I, could, I did end up going inpatient to stay safe. I got better, obviously, a, a miracle in five days. And I, I mean, I'm all better now, let me out. Well, what'd your husband say? I don't know, let's call him. 42 days later, I'm back in. Hi again. 
Okay, maybe I wasn't better. There were so many dark nights. So many, so much darkness. But one night in particular, I was standing in the kitchen again, because the kitchen's very significant. To explore what the kitchen means, right? <laughs> Food, kitchen, done, figured it out. <laughs> I'm standing there with something that I know could hurt me very badly. And all of a sudden I hear a voice that says, there's a three-year-old little girl in the room right next to you. You don't want her to find you. And I dropped what I was holding and I faced the darkness straight in the eyes. And I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm gonna do everything that I can. I'm gonna fight for her. Because right now I'm worth nothing. That's what I thought. So I fought for her. So she could have her mom. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, until one day I woke up and I realized I was fighting for me. That's how it works. Don't wait until you love yourself. Don't wait to fight for yourself until you feel like the time. It's never gonna feel right, ever. Find something to fight for and that's what I did and I fought and I fought and I I faced the demons from the past and the things that had happened to me. I released grief that I needed to feel. I needed to grieve some losses in my past that were continuing to help me stay sick, if that makes sense. There is not just one thing that creates a mental health condition in someone's life. It's a very complex set of origins. You have heredity, biology, genetics, you have family, you have trauma, you have your upbringing, everything contributes to the mental health of each individual, and my mental health was no different. So now that I know I can leave a roadmap, hopefully for other people to follow. And I want to inspire people just give it a shot. Just take it one day at a time. If you're afraid, then you must be doing something right. If you're considering stepping out of your comfort zone and you're getting uncomfortable and you want to really want to start starting to take a look at issues in your life and you're starting to feel a little uneasy, good. That's where you want to be. With our mental health, we all have mental health, just like we all have heart health, but not all of us have mental illness. So when it's the stigma, we talk about, well, you guys do mental health awareness. Oh, nice. But we don't have that. <laughs> what, you don't have a brain? Probably not. You can pretend all you want that it doesn't affect you, I'll be here when you need me. And doesn't it level it out? We all have mental health. So not all of us have brain disease. And so I go through the high schools and then Cal Poly and talk about the normalcy, just normal. It's an organ, yeah, that just happens to create your thoughts. And it creates your, your actions, right? It sends those messages. Poor brain, it's a bad rap. It has such a hard job. And we just like, do do? just stop on it. I feel, anyway. <laughs> Stigma. That negative, judgmental, ooh, you have that. He did what? He heard a voice? Or, she wanted to die. Oh wow, I've never heard of that. Suicide has affected all of our lives. It is in our TV shows, it is in our books, it is in our music, it is in our culture. 
we need to change our relationship with suicide. We need to change how we talk about suicide. But we will not change the way we talk about suicide until we change the way we talk about ourselves. Does that make sense? Our attitude of suicide is a reflection of our own dysfunction. Just calling people out the way it is. We would not be treating suicide the way we are unless we were willing to admit our own insecurity and our own judgment against ourselves. Does that make sense? I'm not afraid anymore. Because I know that I am not alone on my journey. And I call it a journey because I'm not done yet. Are you done yet? Are you done yet? You done yet? Still going? You? <laughs> not till I'm dead. You done? You're on your journey, right? We're all on a journey. You gotta say yes because you are. Of course. Are you done? No. We are not done and we're in it together. So let's not pretend that we're a group of individuals who live separate lives that can't connect with one another. We're all in this together. I put an assembly for schools. Can you tell I like to talk to schools? <laughs> Called, we're in this together. Like, literally, you're all sitting here, and you, every single one of you, because I've seen the drawings. I've seen them draw their anxiety on paper, and guess what they're drawing, folks? They're not drawing anxiety. They're drawing emotional pain. And it is intense. These are 12, 13, and 14 year old children. When given permission, will tell you everything in exchange for hope. Maybe that's why it's so scary to connect with teens because they're so brutally honest. And they'll tell you exactly what they need and exactly what's hurting them. Are we brave enough to hear the answer? I don't think adults are brave enough yet. Some of us are. Or sometimes that's a rhetorical question I just take to literal. <laughs> so for this campus today, let's start something. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we got one. Give yourself a round of applause. Fifteen people are already in this, and we're in this together. The clubs on the campus are just starting to soar. <laughs> Don't clip my wings, damn it! Let me soar. Let me do what I want. Let me be free. Let me be myself. Don't judge me. But I'm not afraid of people judging any me, me anymore. Do you know why? Because I stopped judging myself. And I don't really give a crap what people think. Because that's not my problem. Or, well, maybe my outfits need to be cute, though, I really don't. <laughs> I would like to say that, that kind of cute though, for Instagram. Because <laughs> everything is, it needs to be filtered on Instagram, to be real. <laughs> right? Yeah. You just gotta say positive things about yourself. I just, you know, once you get rolling, okay, have you ever? <laughs> Have you ever been in one of those above ground pools that aren't that big? And you have like two or three of you, and like, hey, let's all start walking in one direction, right? <laughs> and then you get the flow going, and then you're like, okay, let's try to turn around. And you're like, oh, you can't. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get going. So that if you turn around and try to go the other way, it's gonna be really awkward and really hard. Right? Thank you so much for giving me the space to share with you. Thank you so much for giving me a place to just throw out there those experiences and those thoughts. I really hope that you take some of that with you and just explore it for yourself, for the people you love. Don't go diagnosing your friends. <laughs> Do that, even though I have. <laughs> I got my whole family figured out. What are you talking about? Watch it, Mom. I'm just kidding. I pick on her all the time. She loves it. I am open now for questions. Um, let's
let's have a conversation. We have 10 more minutes, or as long as you want, because I have nowhere to be. <laughs> I think there's more pizza, right? Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the road, but you didn't say it in detail. The road to getting better. The road to getting better? Yeah. In particular, the process? Yeah, I mean, what, what did you do? How did you get better? Just... I relied, I relied, really relied heavily on a treatment team and self-care. Those so are the, those, and, and the treatment team would be, you know, I, I take a, a multidisciplinary approach is extremely important um, for treating both of my illnesses, the, the bipolar and the eating disorder. It was always a therapist, a dietitian, a psychiatrist, or a psychiatric nurse. And, I, and always making that a priority wherever I was at, even when I felt like I was doing well. And even when I was doing, I was just, it, it was almost like it wasn't working at times because I just felt like I was just staying where I was at. And every Saturday morning, I'd be on the sofa and I'd be like, hey, Mia, how are you doing? And I, oh, man. And we'll do it again. And we did it for months. And then all of a sudden, the pain started to come out. So that, the, my road, the process of getting well and staying well are very similar. So for me, a treatment team was vital. I also had to commit to taking care of myself the best that I could at the time. In depression, that's very difficult. I also had a really hard time. I still struggle with the ability to like spend money on myself. Go out and just buy myself something, or just go, you know, walk around the mall just because. Um, those, those are the things that took played a very big role in in getting through those processes, those stages of recovery. So the team that you're talking about was they communicating with each other? Um, yes, in a lot of ways. The, um, two times it was an inpatient team. One in Bermuda was inpatient eating disorder treatment. And then I had four years of outpatient treatment in and out at, right after that. And then I was just seeing a therapist. And then once the suicidality hit, 2010, 2011, I was again full time every week with my therapist, every week with my dietitian and my, my nurse. And I believe if they were communicating with each other, they did an excellent job with wrapping around that. My family, they played the part of, we're here to support you how we can, if you need us. But they were not in particularly involved in my checking on my thoughts for the day. And you know, it was, it was very much still my, my journey and my recovery, which helped me with emotional boundaries. Hmm. You know, in a lot of ways, it helped me, you know. So it wasn't my marriage or my parent, you know, me as a mother, or me as a wife. And, and that played a part too. You know, we have, all, we have different roles. And we have, we're moms and we're sisters and we're, you know, so we have these different, um, but for me, for those years that I was in active recovery, I did my best to stay focused on what I needed to do to beat this disease. And, it, and I think it really paid off. And now it has had a huge impact on the other relationships in my life. And now that I'm more well, I can explore, you know, the, how it's impacted my marriage, how it's impacted my, my, my view of myself as a mother. Um, because it touches everything. Our mental health touches every aspect of our lives. So if a person was in wanting help, where would you suggest that you got your help mostly? Because Right now in our community, the resources are very limited. Mm -hmm. And so when referring or advising somebody, it's getting a perspective from you, where do you think would be the best place to advise them to start that you might have got the best uh, care quicker or results quicker or some kind of, I don't know how else to say that. Um. Just to, well, to put it, give it a timeline, I was, I went through five therapists before I found the one, and I was ready for her. Because you could get the best therapist, you could get hooked up with a therapist today who clicks with you, and if you're not ready to deal, 
if you're not really ready to show up and do that, then it's not going to happen. I was ready when I was ready, but it took me time to find therapists. So in, when, I, when I hear somebody saying, like I've had people call me and say, you know, okay, I want to refer someone, they want help, where do they go? I typically personally refer to people that I have worked with or know. I don't like to give people lists. because I like the warm handoffs as much as possible to try to connect. Or if I don't know them, I contact someone and says, have you ever worked with this person? You know, is this going to be something? Because I, I think it's, it's a lot more personal if we find help together. And, but that, um, as an advocate, I can do that. I'm not a therapist or I'm not a clinician. Clinicians have a different dynamic, of course, with their, their clients. But I like to try to find personal connections. Okay, so I'm hearing you say that it kind of took it um, for you to decide, I'm going to get the help now. I'm, you went to different people and it didn't work for you. And then at one point you said, I'm ready to do some work. So it kind of reminds me of uh, some like addiction yes. stuff as well. People try over and over and over again, and then one day they go, this is it, this is the last straw. I'm gonna really connect, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna do the program, I'm gonna try to get better, this yeah. is it. Yeah, So is save ourselves. So kind of where the mental health kind of it goes around too? Absolutely, I, okay. I see it very, very similar. My therapist didn't do it for me, I did it. Yeah. She just happened to be, holding that space and that right and of course she was very good at understanding suicidality and eating disorder patients right because I was actively suicidal for, for about five years yes and I was going to say I'm actually not a student here on campus but um, I have taken classes here before but as far as students um, I'm sure there's something mm -hmm. like either a teacher connects with somebody or some faculty member and a student says something. I'm sure there's some place that there's, is recommended. There's a reporting system on campus. Like if you're staff or faculty, you can communicate with like a team of people. You can say, I'm concerned about this student for X, Y, Z. We fill out this little questionnaire. Right. And so it's just a, a system to report. Well, Report's kind of the bad word. Well, and, and there's a system, you know, yeah. it depends on, on where where I speak. Okay. There are, if it's an open community forum, I usually pick like the mental, slow mental health, the resource line, slow hotline is a really good place to just begin the journey of connection. I also remind people it's going to be a journey in finding help. It doesn't necessarily happen overnight unless you call a crisis line and you do the crisis conversation. It's a prepare them for this process of finding someone and, and getting the appointment and then maybe coming up with some sort of a plan until then. How are we going to stay connected? Are we going to check in every day? Is it going to be a phone call? Are we going to put the app, the teen line online, if they're a young person, are we going to put that app on your phone um, so you can you know, stay connected? And I think the planning is being realistic. We need to make sure people know that we don't have a therapist available all over town. This, right. this community does not have that. But what this exactly. community does have is a group of phenomenal nonprofits mm -hmm. that are here. See, people think that there's nothing, but there is. There's just not enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's here. We're here, but it's just, it's just not enough yet. And so that's why if we take that we're in this together approach, we are going to find what our community needs. We're not we're going to feel less like we're open at the yellow pages. There are, maybe it's more of a lack of just awareness of what this, what is in this community. But now, I, I'm a transplant. I'm not from San Luis. I've actually moved here from Arizona. I've lived there for 10 years. And I, um, for, for the, t the size of this community, if you look at the provider list of all the, not maybe not personal clinicians, but the organizations, the, rat the ratio is huge. What we need is more psychiatrists. And, and being why? Why would you say that? Just people. Because I, I know I know people that are wait on waiting lists to get into well, psychiatrists. So the, yeah. di <clears throat> the difference between a therapist and a psychiatrist is that one's a medical doctor and he can Correct. prescribe medication. Right. Correct. So when I ask that, I'm assuming that you uh, advocate more of the medications. 
No, so I, I advocate for both. The reason why is because I, people need to get a proper diagnosis. Yeah. So if I only refer to a therapist, then they, they might not be dealing with the symptoms. It's very important to see a therapist, but they've got to get a, a proper diagnosis so you can know exactly what's going on with that person. If they have a, a clinically diagnosable eating disorder, is it disordered eating? Is it clinical depression? Is it bipolar? Um, and a, a person, a psychiatrist that has a good, solid reputation, we have quite a few. I have an excellent psychiatric nurse in this community. Both of my psychiatrists have been here, but they have long waiting lists. Mm -hmm. I think the system is broken. Because, uh, yes. I have a friend that I was trying to help, and I could get her help for anything that's too late. So. Yes, it's hard. It's a very hard um, situation to be in when you're looking for help for someone, and it's a, it is too late. And on the other end of this, the way that any kind of illness can uh, begin is from something, okay, so a person is born and they die, right? In between, they live their life. So in your situation, I don't know how it happened, but you talked a little bit about all the different ways that mental health can um, happen. Right? You can develop a mental health condition. Okay, so my theory, Multiple factors, yeah. Um, is that I know we need the help now for all the people that are having major problems. Mm -hmm. It's across America, major problems. They're finally talking about it, they're getting out there, they're getting the help they need, which is super great. But the issue that I find is that that's important. But we need to find out what happened. Why is it happening so the new generation of people can, we can stop it, we can prevent the mental health problems, because as you know, there's a lot of things that can happen as you mm -hmm. grow up a that lot. can cause a lot of problems. And, and I think that we, uh, as a culture, didn't realize how much of an impact that had on people until now we're recognizing all of this mental health issues mm -hmm. are related to a lot of insecurities and problems in their upbringing, uh, stable homes, uh, a violent homes. Right. Um, Abuse and trauma. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's great to have the care to provide for the people, but it has to be fixed, you know, at the other end of the deal, too, so that the new generation doesn't come up. So I'm right. wondering, um, does the transitional mental health, is that what it's called? Uh, are you trying to reach out in any way to, that, to fix that or to look at that or? Um, well, for me personally, I don't work with, I work, don't work for transitions. Oh, okay. Um, but I know that there are organizations within the community and the nation that are doing the, pre they want to do preventative mm -hmm. interventions. They want to build healthy families, build uh, strong teens, strong, um, you know, individuals that are living mentally well to hopefully um, prevent uh, mental health conditions from becoming so severe. Mm -hmm. You know, someone can still develop a mental health condition because it's genetic. Like I have, I have some in, it, in my family. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying this is that fault and it's that fault and it's that fault. It's just everything just sort of contributed to, to its circumstances. Yeah. Um, but I, I get to see it as I, what's because I'm on the other side. I have hope that people are resilient. Were, were any of you a teenager? <laughs> okay, so we, we do, we survive. We probably use unhealthy things to survive, but we do get through, and so I think there are organizations that are coming alongside certain populations and saying, hey, let's try to stay well and make these choices so that this doesn't become a problem, mm -hmm. so that this doesn't become a severe, debilitating disease, and you're on disability the rest of your life. Right. Right? Right. From, from the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA who are trying to build confidence in kids, they're contributing yeah. to, the, to the high school program through Transitions Mental Health, where they go in and actually teach what is mental health. They're contributing. Right. Cal Poly now has a suicide prevention coordinator who's teaching. They're contributing. Yeah. It almost feels like it's kind of like uh, just an explosion of everybody saying, 
let me tell you what happened to me. It's not okay. And we need to stop it so it doesn't happen With the to stigma? anybody else. Yeah, With stigma, the stigma and, and shame. And everything. I mean, we yeah. obviously know what's going on uh, with the sexual stuff going on with uh, our government. And then, of course, everywhere, you open up the page of the newspaper and you're like, what? What is going on? Yeah. There's a lot of hurting people. Yeah, there's a lot of awful things going on. And I think that we need to start, where I like to start down at the, where the children are coming into school and then talk to them there. And so they know what's normal and not normal behaviors and, and, and then they could be the ones reaching out saying, hey, this is what's happening. That's right. Yeah. Starting a new generation. You have a question? I was just gonna kind of comment alongside that. I think that that in itself, it's not enough, like we need to do the parenting and all that, but I think that once you learn your own mental health and everything, understand yourself better, then you can set those healthy boundaries with your parents or with friends or whoever, right. and then that mm -hmm. kind of propels yes. them into acting a different way, you know, right. yeah. a different way. We're our own, you know, I, I, I am me for my family. I am mental health awareness for my family. No yeah. one else is mental health awareness for my child or my relatives, like that's me. I ha I'm the role model. So. My community, my family, I'm going to be the one because that's what changes lives. Yes. So I am not, no one looks at a national hotline and goes, oh my gosh, my life is so changed because I called it. It's like, mm -hmm. you need to be, so that empowers you. You can be the person. You can be prevention right now. Right. In and the, in I, the, in your I space think that it influence. would be great to, to just teach it to everybody. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, and so, we're going to right. set you up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and we're going to put you well, on the road. The reason why I say that is that we already have a platform. We have a, a child from preschool now, yeah. all the way to high school. Why can't we start there? And by the time they come out, they're already taught. Girl, they we, don't need, have we need to, to talk. Because it's, like, it's a great <laughs> idea. I have education. one question behind you. <laughs> yeah, so on the note of family and all this, how, yes. how was the dynamics then? I'm sure, I mean, obviously your husband loves you unconditionally. Mm -hmm. um, how, how could he, how did he help you in some ways? Or how did he respect mm. how it was going? And what did, what's the dynamics of a family that's, that you've learned that's best? My husband respected my boundaries. When I asked him, you know, like when it came to the eating disorder, when I was sick with the eating disorder through most of our marriage, um, I said, you know, I, I don't need you to be the food police. Mm -hmm. And he respected that. And he never was. Good. And he was consistently there. He never said, he, he, he never said I completely understand because he couldn't. Correct. And he never promised me that everything was going to be okay because he didn't know. But he was just this consistent placeholder and I remember laying in bed and being reeked with just with anxiety and fear like someone's gonna you know, attack my house you know it's just this very rational fear and there he is just laying in bed next to me and we're holding hands and he's that this is this lifeline like to the, to the world just him there it's like I'm not alone and he worked two jobs consistently for years so I didn't have to worry about anything and I didn't have to go to work. That's he literally put his, almost all of his life on hold. And, and that's extremely compassionate. How about though when, uh, I don't know if this was your case, but a lot of people have, I'm calling them episodes. Yes. Just angry and not making sense really or break, pulling things from the past and, and lashing out and People, which yes. can occur. So it can definitely what was, occur. I don't know. I don't ever remember case. doing that. Okay, good. But I do. I do remember what what he had to to deal with on a on a very daily basis was: Is my wife going to be dead when I get home? And he'd find me in the closet, or I wouldn't answer the phone for hours and hours and hours. He'd have to come home and see if I was still alive. But it was unconditional. But he wasn't peaceful. going anywhere because it was right. like when he came into the hospital to see me. He told me that I was so drugged to keep myself from killing myself that I was gone in my eyes. And he said that he didn't know if I was ever gonna come back because of how much drugs I had to be on. 
And I remember he, you know, he's a very reserved man, you know, and, and he was wearing sunglasses and he did not take them off. Um, the only indication I had of what he was feeling was one tear came down his cheek. And in a lot of ways, I tried to keep my pain from him and my daughter, but I realized that I never could. They were living through hell with me. It was our pain. So in a way, me fighting for them was me fighting for me. And was that your safe, your safe haven, your, your family per se, so that you always count on them? Always. And my daughter, you know, she still is afraid mommy's gonna leave. Like, I'm just gonna disappear somewhere. It's because I was, I'd get sick and I'd leave and I'd go to, I'd go impatient. You know, and so there's still this fear of I'm gonna leave her. And my illness did that. I didn't. Right, but there was a good reason. But there was a good reason. It's like, you know, I like, well, then, with the you flu, know, I don't want to spread it. Right, you know, to your right, face. right. So I just. So that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. But families can play a, a healthy role, or they can play an enabling role. And so, if you are in active recovery, if you're fighting for your own brain and your own sanity. Right now is a good time to just focus on you, and not the dynamics of your relationships. It's just too much to take on, if possible, if possible. You know, and now you have family members that are trying to help. Uh, depends on the person's disease. My disease, I was not a rager. I did not hurt my family physically. I did not have episodes of those natures. I was destroying myself. I was the self-harmer. You know, I, I was the one that was living with demons inside her head. And I wouldn't tell anyone. Um, but everyone's disease affects their family differently. So there are some family members that have to, have to very much be involved in how are we going to handle this at home if you're going to live here with whatever it is you're battling. Because the family also has boundaries and they deserve to stay safe. And they have their own bill of rights. So... You know, you just because you're sick doesn't mean you don't have to take responsibility. Well, that's like for friendships, right? For, yeah. kid, for kids on campus. Mm -hmm. for yeah. Kids. yeah. Yeah. Take responsibility. Can I answer any other questions this afternoon before we wrap up? You know what? If I had time, I would take you all to Starbucks because you look sleepy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's that pizza. It's just like, oh, yeah, you guys are really. All right, 